Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first GGS webinar of 2024. Um, during the Christmas period and New Year, I'm so pleased that you've not forgotten about us due to the number that have signed up for today. I'm delighted to have you back. Um, we have a new, really exciting series of webinars for you this year, starting with ground gas hazards, phase one desk studies, the conceptual site model, and when gas monitoring isn't needed, which is something that we'd all like to know. Um, so uh, my name is Emma. I'm marketing manager here at GGS and you will have heard from no doubt some of you would have heard from me in the past but for those that um, have, have just joined us for the first time today you'll hear me uh, from me again via email after the webinar with a recording um, of the session should you wish to um, hear it again and watch it again. Um, I invite all of you to use the Q&A and chat functions throughout the session if you have a question to ask. So don't feel that you have to wait. Pop it in there. And then whenever Simon has finished the slides, we'll pick up on as many of your questions as we can then. Um, we expect to be here for around an hour and there'll be a Q&A, as just mentioned. And today our presenter is Simon Talbot, who is the founder and managing director of GGS. So now I'll hand you over to him. Thank you very much, Emma, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining me today. Um, so for content over the next hour, I will be going through will be uh, as shown here. Uh, a brief introduction to myself and the company, um, then diving into the main content, which is the ground gas hazard, the ground gas management process, where monitoring is not required, but looking at more detail of a monitoring risk assessment and protection uh, process, uh, finishing off with uh, just in case decisions where some, some um, um, mistakes can be made, and, and then a summary with case study. And I'll be making references to relevant guidance documents throughout the presentation. So the first, first slide, um, an introduction, and I'll just turn my uh, camera off so I'm not distracting anyone. So an introduction. I am uh, a engineering geologist by training, environmental geologist by practice, and I set up GGS in 2009. We are UK based. Uh, we uh, work across the UK and occasionally in Europe. Um, we have a staff of 25 over three offices in Scotland, uh, head office in Stockport and in Stevenage. Uh, our senior staff have got almost 100 years of ground gas monitoring and risk assessment experience between them. We are pioneers of continuous ground gas monitoring, and uh, we'd like to think of ourselves as market leaders in, in the development and, and use of, of continuous monitoring devices. And we, we deliver a range of specialist environmental monitoring services around ground gas to a, a range of clients, uh, consultants, regulators, developers, property managers. So the range of projects we've been involved in range from the North, the Fourth Road Bridge, uh, major infrastructure projects. Uh, a lot of our work is associated with uh, housing development, uh, but we also do a certain amount of uh, industrial emissions monitoring, landfill compliance monitoring, uh, remediation compliance monitoring, as well as uh, things like um, dock redevelopments. And this was in Gothenburg in Sweden. So very varied, but all ground gas related. And our services revolve around our core offering, which is continuous ground gas monitoring, but we do all the traditional ground gas uh, spot monitoring, permit compliance monitoring, subflow void. Uh, we do dissolved gas analysis and sampling. We do permit surrender and flux box and surface emission surveys, uh, gas sampling analysis, laboratory testing. Uh, as well as uh, monitoring uh, existing and new developments. So specialist environmental monitoring and risk assessment around that ground gas um, sector. 
So that's enough about me and the company. Let's dive in and talk about the ground gas hazard. And as many of you will know, one of the first incidents in the UK which brought ground gas to the attention of, of the wider uh, uh, public and um, our um, geo-environmental community was the Losco explosion of 1986. And the public inquiry after that identified a number of key factors that many of you will be very familiar with if you're involved in contaminated land. Uh, a source, and in the case of the Losco, it was an unlined landfill at the edge of a housing development, uh, a pathway, which were fractured sandstones, which dipped up under Clark Avenue and number 51, the, the specific receptor, um, housing receptor uh, in this incident. So that source pathway receptor contaminant linkage is, is the uh, underpinning of the UK's contaminated land uh, regulatory regime. But this public inquiry also identified a fourth factor which is unique to ground gas contamination, and that is a, a driving mechanism. And in the case of LOSCO, it was a low pressure system which passed over the country in the preceding hours. And it dropped the atmospheric pressure by uh, over 20 millibars in the preceding six hours prior to the explosion at 6.30 in the morning. And that drop in atmospheric pressure um, effectively sucked the landfill gas through the pathway into the subfloor void of number 51. And when the central heating system tripped in at 6.30 in the morning, that explosive mixture was ignited and the house was destroyed. So this event was a catalyst for a lot of guidance documents being published. But despite the raft of guidance which is out there, um, incidents still happen. And one of the more uh, recent well-publicized events was the Gorebridge incident in Scotland. This was a new housing estate built in 2009 by Midlothian Council or social housing. But unfortunately, in September 2013, a number of council tenants were overcome by carbon dioxide and they were taken to hospital and the affected properties were evacuated. And then over the course of the next few, few months, uh, a total of 22 tenants had sought medical help. And at that point, the local NHS trust set up an incident management team to investigate the causes of this. And the coal authority, the local authority, and uh, 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 other uh, um, specialist consultants were appointed to investigate this event. The result was that um, shallow mine workings were identified as the, the, the cause, and um, the, 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 dis the action which Midlothian Council took uh, to remediate the, the site was to actually start again. And the whole estate was demolished. All 64 homes were, were, were uh, demolished. And the affected families had to be rehoused and are still having to be rehoused while the site is being redeveloped. Um, I should say that there were other uh, repercussions. The overarching uh, lead consultant is no longer trading and a number, a number of the uh, subcontractors have actually been taken through the Scottish courts. So quite serious uh, implications, but luckily no one was killed in this incident. So the hazards that we are concerned with involve asphyxiation, which was the Gore Bridge um, uh, hazard from carbon dioxide, but it could also be from nitrogen. We have an explosive risk from methane or hydrogen. We have oxidizing gases, uh, we have toxic gases, we have uh, um, carcinogenic gases associated with anthropogenic VOCs in the main, as well as naturally occurring radon. And these gases fall into uh, two categories. These are acute hazards which can be realized almost uh, immediately or in a very short period of time. And then the others are chronic uh, hazards which can build up over long periods of time measured in months 
years or in some cases decades. So we've got different timescales to think about, and we've also got different concentrations. If we think about the explosive risk of methane, this is explosive between um, uh, 15 and 5% by volume, the upper and lower explosive limits. But if we look at the toxic risk associated with carbon monoxide, there we're looking at a small parts per million concentration as being the, the critical hazard. So this leads us on to the source risk factors. And these are twofold, really. Uh, gas concentrations, which I've made reference to already, and also gas flow rate, or put it a different way, um, the source generation rate or the source volume. And those two are, can, can be quite different. Um, by way of example, at one end of the, of the spectrum, we have modern licensed landfills. These um, uh, with putrescible waste, municipal waste, for instance, these will be generating landfill gas at, at volumes of uh, 10 cubic meters per tonne per year. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we have naturally occurring um, organic rich soils, such as peat deposits. And below the water table, you'll get anaerobic uh, respiration, methanogenesis, and these can be generating methane at concentrations of 90% plus. But the difference is that maybe 90% methane, but it will be generated at very, very slow rates of generation. When somewhere between those two extremes, you have these former landfills. These uh, typically dating from the 60s or 70s and 80s, which were convenient holes in the ground belong, beyond the town boundary or the city boundary, um, which were former uh, uh, sand pits or quarries, which were uh, remediated, brought back to uh, ground level by infilling with uh, um, mixed, waste, mis mixed wastes or municipal wastes. Um, and these can be generating uh, landfill gas at relatively or a range of, uh, of volumes uh, and may be generating uh, volumes of landfill gas for, for decades to come. The problem is that they are unlined and unregulated um, and that methane uh, and carbon dioxide is either uh, escaping naturally to atmosphere or leaking sideways into permeable uh, strata surrounding them. And then we have brownfield sites, these former industrial sites that have reached the end of their life, uh, which uh, and the, the, the properties have been demolished and the sites are now available for redevelopment. Um, for um, accidental or, or deliberate um, disposal of, of, of uh, chemicals on these sites can give rise to a whole cocktail of different VOCs, depending on what industrial processes were, were present on those sites. Those VOCs can be a significant health risk for the, the new occupants of those redeveloped sites. Then the final ca uh, um, um, category I, I bring attention to are those areas of, the, of Great Britain, which is underlain by coal fields. And the Coal Authority uh, have estimated that 11% of the footprint of the UK is actually underlain by coal fields. And almost all of these will have been mined at shallow depth at one time in the past. So a little bit more detail of, of these particular risks, starting with those brownfield sites. The National Housing Federation report of 2018 identified that there were 17,000 brownfield sites um, which are in England, and there'll be a similar distribution in, in Scotland and, and, and Wales. And many of these sites will be potentially gas contaminated. And the question is, to what degree? Similarly, uh, uh, there are um, 
mapped uh, former historical landfills. The Environment Agency have a lot of records of these, and they have mapped uh, almost 20,000 in England. And again, these will be uh, similar densities associated with towns and cities in, in Wales and in Scotland. The question is that many of these will be uh, gas contaminated. And again, the question is to what degree? So focusing on uh, landfills for, for a moment, I'm just going to make reference to the effects of the 1956 Clean Air Act. Prior to this, a lot of uh, industrial and municipal waste uh, involved uh, ash, relatively inert, um, benign uh, products. It may have heavy metals, but from a ground gas point of view, pretty, pretty benign. Um, and these were associated with limited regulation, uh, largely ash from domestic fires, and because of the ash was, was dusty, uh, the refuse collectors were termed dustmen, uh, a term which many of you will be familiar with. With um, almost all homes uh, after the Second World War being heated by uh, open coal fires, industrial processes also being heated and uh, um, powered by uh, coal coal fires or, or, and boilers, uh, there was a huge amount of, of smoke and smog, and it was the deadly effects of the smog in our cities that gave rise to the requirement for uh, the Clean Air Act. And over a, 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 a relatively short period of time, uh, our waste streams changed dramatically as a consequence. Uh, open fires were prohibited in, in uh, many towns and cities, and as a consequence, what were uh, um, the newspapers or potato peelings, which were thrown on on the open fire in 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 the in in, in the parlour, um, that that putrescible waste was then put into a bin and uh, taken to 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 landfill. Uh, so the quantity of waste dramatically increased, um, as well as the composition. The composition uh, from being relatively inert became highly putrescible. And this gave rise to a, a, a crisis in how to dispose of, of our municipal waste. And hence, and over uh, almost 20,000 um, uh, unlined, unmanaged former landfills across the U, uh, across England. But in 74, this gave rise to uh, problems and the Clean uh, Control of Pollution Act in 1974 uh, attempted to regulate it. But the term dilute and disperse was, was used for these sites. It wasn't until post-1990 that, and, and the advent of the Environmental Protection Act that full containment and gas management systems were, were required. So a lot of our work at GGS and, and a lot of concerns that you will have in your organizations will focus on uh, these post-1956 landfills, which are uh, highly putrescible, uh, which haven't got any containment systems. So in my career, a lot of my work has been uh, in early days was associated with trying to understand and uh, risk assess um, uh, ground gases that were migrating from a source, such as a former landfill, towards a receptor. But nowadays, a lot of the work we do is associated with uh, monitoring and risk assessing uh, uh, gassing sources, which are beneath the footprint of proposed development. Uh, and um, we will see that sometimes this is quite problematic. Sometimes it can be uh, achieved quite easily. So those, this is introducing pathways and ground gases will migrate through permeable strata where, which are not saturated. 
uh, typically soils uh, in the near surface environment, but also think about uh, fissure flow through the rocks and even what may be termed or, or considered as impermeable rocks like slate or, or granite, uh, they will have joints which will allow fissure flow, which will be quite dramatic or can be quite, quite, uh, quite permeable through those uh, fissures and joints. We also have pathways into our receptors, into our buildings. And these may be associated with uh, site, site investigation boreholes or monitoring wells or uh, imperfectly sealed uh, drilling and grouting holes. And that was one of the main, main problems we had in Gorebridge. But also pile foundations, fibrostone columns, screw piles, not necessarily all that common in the UK, um, but also driven piles. The driven piles can, uh, in the near surface uh, zone, uh, have an annulus associated with the vibration of the driven pile. And that can give a vertical pathway right up under the, the development. And then we have uh, construction defects within the new development themselves, cracks through the raft foundations or, or, or through uh, um, the, the, uh, floor, uh, the flooring. And this brings us on to receptors themselves. And receptors fall into a number of different categories and considered to be the most sensitive would be residential properties because people could be living in these 24 hours a day. Slightly less sensitive are business premises and offices. They consider to be less sensitive because um, people will not be working in them all the time and typically just for, for an eight hour working day. Uh, and then we have uh, other commercial properties, which may be uh, larger um, portal frame uh, sheds with large volumes inside. And these are lower risk again, because any ground gases which enter them may be uh, effectively diluted in the large volume of, of uh, open space within them. Caveat there will be the um, uh, small office spaces or, or, or cupboards or, or, or storerooms, which may um, represent confined spaces within them. And finally, not forgetting construction sites uh, and construction workers who, who, who are building these new developments. And in particular, um, um, uh, open uh, excavations or trenches. I, I made reference to the asphyxiating risk from carbon dioxide. Well, carbon dioxide is heavier than air, and it can, uh, if there's a, a gas source nearby to such an excavation, carbon dioxide can flow in and just sit as a blanket within these excavations. And unfortunately, people have been uh, killed by um, asphyxiation by going down into such excavations. So the health and safety executive will consider things like this uh, open excavation as a confined space uh, in those circumstances. So let's move on to the ground gas management process. And there's five elements to think of. We have investigation, we have a risk assessment, we have a, a design, uh, we have, have then the installation of uh, gas protection measures, and finally verification of, of those systems. So um, it's only with that verification that we've been able to close that circle in, uh, since the publication of Sirius C735 back in 2014, which is 10 years ago now. And that has shone a spotlight on the quality of installation. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So uh, some of the key documents that uh, we refer to uh, the Ground Gas Handbook, which is a very readable uh, summary of, of all of the elements of, of, of ground gas protection. Um, the BS8576, published in 2013, it's now up for review. It's, uh, it's over 10 years since this was published. And this is a guidance on investigating ground gases. 
but also um, some of the Clare uh, research bulletins or technical bulletins, and in particular, RB17, a pragmatic approach to ground gas risk assessment. And I'll make reference to this in a moment. So um, for those of you who are local authority uh, officers, um, the ground gas handbook, which costs 80 pounds for consultants, you can get it free of charge, exactly the same publication, but published um, under uh, the CIEH as the Local Authority Guide to Ground Gas, 2008. Uh, 2008. Um, so that's freely available to members of CIEH. So um, the first stage of an investigation will be that phase one desk study. And this will have a number of uh, uh, sources of information which are brought together. Um, the site history, um, published geology and hydrogeology, uh, the site topography, um, perhaps a very important uh, element, that site walkover survey, identifying uh, visible features on, on the site which are of note. Possibly um, gathering anecdotal information from people who uh, used to work on the site or, or live uh, adjacent to it can be very useful uh, information which gives you a, a line of evidence to, to, to investigate. And then finally, putting all of this together into the context of proposed development. And the phase one desk study uh, process is discussed in BS 8576. Uh, and they talk through um, what is required to be included in that preliminary conceptual site model and uh, um, what needs to be considered are potential sources, uh, potential receptors, credible pathways, as well as foreseeable events such as uh, changing uh, groundwater levels, uh, uh, extreme weather events, things which may uh, uh, be classified as worst case conditions. And all of that information is then pulled together into that preliminary conceptual model. And importantly, in respect of ground gas contamination, BS 8576 uh, requires that that information is presented in a, 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 a schematic uh, cross section through the site. So that the, the relationships between uh, the sources or pathways and receptors can be clearly uh, defined. And um, from that, you can design a site investigation which will validate that uh, preliminary conceptual model. So you could, should think of, of conceptual site models as a live document, as new information comes in, you should revisit this and update it with, with the latest information. But at the desk study stage, this schematic cross-section should allow you to design an appropriate site investigation, probably involving trial pits or boreholes to, to prove the ground conditions and the level of contamination. So the next stage is uh, looking at monitoring and when monitoring may not be required. So going back to this conceptual model, the stages of risk assessment are, uh, there's three tiers. There's tier one, which is, is there a credible contaminant linkage? Tier two, looking at generic risk assessment from uh, monitoring data. Tier three, is looking at a site-specific detailed risk assessment. And each of those uh, elements should be supported by multiple lines of evidence. You shouldn't hang your hat on just one, one uh, piece of evidence. What you're wanting is credibility from uh, similar, um, diverse sources of information which give you the same um, uh, interpretation. So looking at Claire RB17, and specifically when monitoring is not required, this flowchart sets out a number of, of key 
key stages in, in the process. And I'll focus in on, on this. Has any of the following been identified? I'll just blow this up on, on the right hand side. Uh, firstly, is there a credible source and pathway for offsite? Is the site a registered landfill? Is there on site made ground greater than five meters or an average of three meters? Has representative total organic com uh, content results been taken from soil samples? From for instance, the made ground, do they exceed the maximum values for a CS3? And if the answer is no to all of those, then the site can be considered uh, a characteristic situation one. There is no gas hazard present. And if that's the case, then uh, you don't need to do any monitoring. Similarly, if a site is underlain by natural uh, impermeable soils with no gassing source present, then again, uh, that site can be considered CS1 and no monitoring should be carried out. Um, that may, uh, you may need to think about radon because radon is a, a specialist case. And there's a webinar devoted to, to radon later, later in the year. So going back to this specific conceptual site model, uh, we have on the right hand side, a unlined uh, former landfill. We've got permeable soils, uh, sands and gravels uh, to the left. And we've got various developments close to the site and then further away. So that risk assessment, that, that tier one, is there a credible contaminant linkage? Well, let's look at this location here, um, where we have uh, housing close to the, the landfill, the gassing landfill. And we have that site, site investigation boreholes and a trial pit, which have demonstrated what the site, site geology is at that location. And it's proved eight meters of boulder clay free of of sand and gravel lenses. Um, but because the site investigation contractor is on site, he's put a monitoring well in. Um, but do you carry out monitoring at that location? Well, if we look at the, the left-hand side, boreholes uh, three and four, there's no boulder clay present there. We've got sands and gravels at shallow depth immediately beneath the, the, the residential properties. Uh, the residential properties have strip footings, uh, but they may be exposed to migrating gases. Borehole two in the center there is not. Eight meters of, of, of clean, um, um, consistent uh, clays is an effective barrier for any migrating gases to the shallow strip footings which are present uh, at, at that location. And monitoring isn't required there. The trouble is that just in case uh, monitoring is carried out, um, despite the fact that there's no credible pollutant linkage, uh, the site investigation contractor has put a monitoring well in and just in case uh, around six rounds of spot monitoring are carried out at that location. And they identify that there's gases present from the response zone uh, in, in the, the deeper soils. Is that relevant to those houses? Well, it, it, it raises a question mark uh, in, the, uh, in respect of the, the, the regulators. I'll come back to that in a moment. So looking back at this process, we've done the investigation, uh, the preliminary investigation, the desk study and, and the, uh, the boreholes and trial pits. And we have monitoring wells. Uh, do we monitor or do, don't we monitor? Well, let's think about the monitoring well itself. And we 
use boreholes and monitoring wells as almost interchangeable terms. But strictly speaking, a monitoring well is constructed within a borehole and often it's constructed by, by the driller. Um, and it will have a number of features or should have a number of features. It should have a, a, a designed response zone which targets a, a strata of interest. It should have a plain pipe section above that which collects the, the, the ground gases and that is protected and sealed into the borehole with a, a, a bentonite clay seal. And then above that, that headspace should be sealed with a bung and, and a valve assembly protected within some sort of headworks. So this should be considered a scientific instrument and it needs to be carefully designed because that response zone needs to be targeting the um, credible pathways that may be present on your site. And if it needs to be carefully designed, it needs to be carefully installed. Unfortunately, drillers, if they're unsupervised, will just throw in a pipe willy-nilly in many cases. You have good drillers and you've got some, some less good drillers. Some uh, good drillers will take care over the installations, others won't. And when they don't, you may get this situation where you've got a slotted pipe from top to bottom. In this case, um, the driller was caught and he said, I forgot to bring any plain pipe from, from the yard this morning when I came to site. But don't worry, I'll cut it off at ground level, put some tape around the top. And once I've cemented it into the headworks, uh, no one will know the difference. And that's true. Once it's cemented in, people, uh, the consultants, uh, the regulators won't know uh, and it, uh, that it is a, a slotted pipe from top to bottom. But if it's slotted pipe from top to bottom, it means that atmospheric air can come in for at least half of, half of the time. But you get some gas, ground gas readings from it. What would be worse would be that if that driller had come from his yard in the morning with just plain pipe, forgetting to put slotted pipe in, like you have here. This is plain pipe from top to bottom and is completely pointless. But if I was cemented in the ground, uh, someone may be going around doing spot monitoring for six rounds, finding no gas and finding it and reporting it as being uh, a CS1 site when it is completely useless and, and um, um, a fraud. So if this is a scientific instrument which needs to be carefully designed, carefully installed, it should be uh, subject to some form of quality, uh, construction quality assurance. But if they are well constructed, then we'd go on to the monitoring stage. Either traditional spot monitoring using handheld devices um, and a dip meter for dipping to the groundwater table. Uh, and you get this uh, tables of, of, of data. Each row represents a monitoring well. Each column is a different parameter measured on, on site. And every time you go to site, you get another table and another table. And, and these tables fill up um, tens of pages of appendices, which regulators love to read through. They can spend hours poring over these tables, really enjoying getting into uh, these numbers. Unfortunately, these numbers take time to interpret and there may be transcription errors associated with them from um, the notes which are perhaps written uh, uh, in field notebooks on a site um, um, smudged by rain or water or, or, or mud uh, and then typed up with uh, an incorrect value. This is becoming less of a problem as um, a lot of handheld devices have digital recording uh, um, functions on them now. Or you can move to continuous monitoring. And continuous monitoring has been around for 15 years. That first generation device was a gas clam, um, but now other devices are available. At GGS, we use a gas sentinel, which is a slightly more sophisticated instrument. It does continuous con concentration monitoring, continuous flow, 
as well as being telemetry enabled. And as a consequence, we have uh, continuous data which shows the full variability uh, of the, the environmental parameters and, and the gas concentrations and flow rates through time. So when is continuous monitoring particularly useful? When there's uncertainty. If you're doing spot monitoring uh, readings at, at that um, borehole four location and you've got 70% methane or thereabouts every time you go to site, you know you've got a problem to deal with. But if you've got variable data sets, perhaps the gas is there, sometimes, sometimes it's not. Have you picked up the highest gas concentration? The only way you can um, interpret that data is by uh, getting uh, confidence in a much larger data set, which captures a greater variability. That takes time, or uh, you could use continuous monitoring, which collects high quality data within a very short period of time. So that's the next uh, time when continuous monitoring may be valuable, when time is short, or when you're trying to prove a negative, that there's no gas risk, perhaps a, a land remediation project or a land development project where a, a, a gas hazard uh, is present on the site, but after reprofiling with clean clays, uh, engineered uh, and, and compacted in layers across the site, um, it can be demonstrated that that gas risk has been, uh, that gas risk pathway has been eliminated. Or by doing receptor monitoring, monitoring the subfloor void to actually identify the, 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 the actual ground gas risk coming up under a particular development. Um, so a lot of um, continuous monitoring uh, data and, and risk assessment has been written up into this CLARE technical bulletin, TB18. Uh, I wrote this with Jeff Card uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, but this is again freely available from either the CLARE website or GGS's website. So, moving on to that risk assessment process, that uh, generic uh, tier two uh, assessment. And that tier two uh, uh, generic model uh, refers to the modified Wilson and Card classification of characteristic situations, which uh, goes from one to six. One, a very low risk, um, lim very low uh, gassing potential on the site, right through to uh, six, which is uh, a recent putrescible landfill, for instance. If you're looking at residential properties, only the top three are, are suitable situations. So looking at this data set, this uh, continuous data set, for those of you who get involved in uh, risk assessment and generic uh, screening, gas screening value, you'll be uh, aware that you, you multiply the gas concentration by the flow rate to get a GSV. Well, with continuous data, you can generate a continuous GSV. And in this case, you can see that despite, um, and, and can overlay the CS uh, thresholds, so despite having 40% methane uh, in this situation, it's relatively low flow rates. And again, the, the gases are only spiking up into CS3 conditions only occasionally. Is that significant? Is that important? Well, you need other lines of evidence uh, to, to determine what is appropriate protection for you, your development. Is it, what is the sensitivity? Uh, what, what other circumstances uh, need to be considered. So perhaps you do need gas protection and it is a either a CS2 or a CS3 situation. So you go to uh, these reference documents, BS8485 and Syria C735. And here in the UK, 
uh, our gas protection measures have two elements to them. It's a dilute and disperse process where um, any gases are safely uh, vented to atmosphere. And the second belt and braces approach is you exclude the gases from um, the, the, uh, the building envelope by having a, a membrane. And typically that membrane installation has to go across a full footprint of a building, cover, covers the, um, um, the, 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 the wall void right up to the, the edge of the development. And uh, it's best to get a qualified installer who will give a good, good um, installation, as you can see here. So let's look at verification. Now, if you do have um, a vented system with a membrane, then if you look at table seven in BS8485, to get the two points for, for, for that element of protection system, it needs to be verified in accordance with Sirius 735, which is one of the normative reference documents. Uh, if you don't, then you can't uh, attach those two points. So if you have, uh, and if we look at uh, B735 in a little bit more detail, there's quite a complex diagram here. Um, if it is a, a complex design, or if there's a higher gas regime present, then you have to do more intensive verification. But take a, a simple example of a CS2 site with small housing, uh, small housing units, up to five to 10, a simple design, and you've got a skilled workforce, then in consequence, any verification needs to be a relatively light touch or you may not need any verification at all. And that is quite uh, acceptable in line with uh, the Sirius 735 guidance. The same is not true for a CS3 site. The requirements there are that an independent verifier is required and that verifier needs to review the installer's method statements. They need to uh, prepare a verification plan carry out that verification and then prepare and present a completed verification report, which may include the installer's CQA data as well. So quite a robust system, which it gives rise to a, a large document. And as a consequence, that is an expensive process. So to minimize the time, uh, minimize the, the, the the errors associated with it, it's best practice to have a qualified installer and a qualified verifier. And a verifier should be uh, a set out in, in the guidance document, competent, experienced, suitably trained, and have immediate access to appropriate technical support where needed or necessary. And the emphasis is on independent third party. Unfortunately, there's a, a lot of cowboys out there who uh, line up with uh, installers and um, the verifier will not, uh, will over, oversee uh, poor installations and turn a blind eye to poor practice. And that needs to be eliminated from our sector. So let's move on to the, the last few slides. And I'm going to finish off with um, um, just in case decisions and the implications associated with that, and then a couple of summary slides and, and a case study. Um, so this is a just in case development uh, or decisions on, a, on a, a new development on an industrial site. It's housing on a derelict industrial site, 10 acres for 100 houses, quite high-end um, um, residential in, uh, um, detached properties. And the phase one report 
identifies that there's probably gas, ground gas contamination associated with a former industrial use of, of the site. The phase two investigation was, is going to cost £50,000 and the uh, con consultant gives the client a, an option. I would go for uh, periodic monitoring or continuous monitoring. The periodic monitoring is going to cost £5,000. And when that's carried out, um, there is a certain amount of uncertainty associated with it. So a consultant uh, classifies the site as CS3, just in case, because the data isn't all that robust. There is a certain amount of uncertainty. So the cost of a project is gas protection measures for um, installing the membrane, um, getting it verified, getting a verification report, um, uh, published is £128,000, roughly £1,280 for a standard uh, property. There's a two week delivery, uh, project delivery delay while that membrane is being uh, installed and verified across the project. Question is who pays for that? Well, a savvy land developer who, who um, understands this is in a former industrial site, will uh, look at that potential cost and negotiate it off the purchase price of the land. A savvy property developer buying it from the land developer will foresee the cost and build it into his project costs. So the, the alternative uh, approach is continuous monitoring. Here the consultant gives the, the option to the uh, developer, um, how, how much do you want to spend on your site investigation? Well, continuous monitoring will give you better data, but it's 10,000 pounds more expensive. Well, um, if that continuous monitoring uh, provided uh, high quality information, which removed the uncertainty, was able to give that site a CS1 classification. The saving to the project would be no additional cost, no uh, delay in the, in the um, development process. Um, and, and that's a win-win for everyone involved. The question is, what happens to the less savvy property developer? Well, the property developer will be given those two options, periodic monitoring or continuous monitoring, and he'll say, oh, there's a cost saving there of £10,000. Well, that's what my quantity surveyor is telling me. I'm going to bank that straight away. There's, that's £10,000 off the development cost. But because he thinks there's going to be gas monitoring, he's already budgeted for that 128. Um, the question is, who pays for that £128,000? Well, that cost will be, be put on the final uh, house purchaser. Um, there's just in case costs which get hidden. And this scenario where the developer uh, moves down to the, the cheapest option is happens all too often. Okay, the last summary slides. In conclusion, Better quality site data reduces uncertainty. Good quality cross-section CSMs are essential. Only monitor if there's a credible contaminant linkage. Multiple lines of evidence provides justification for the decisions that are taken. Avoid just-in-case decisions. The most just-in-case decisions may be, well, I've got a monitoring well installed, I'd better do some monitoring anyway, irrespective of the fact that there's no credible linkage. And if you are putting gas protection measures in, uh, you must have some form of independent verification. So I'll finish off with this uh, case study. This was um, came in the news uh, just over the last few days, uh, a site that we've been involved in 
uh, over an extended period of time. This is a, a former landfill clearly identified in the desk study, a, a whole series of, of site investigations were carried out. Um, it's a proposed for housing development. So there was clear uh, potential contaminant linkage, which needed to be investigated. Initial rounds of spot monitoring identified uh, uh, up to 34% methane and at least CS3 conditions. So is it suitable for private houses? Not sure. So uh, uh, that's a, a site view of it on the ground. So a second phase of uh, monitoring was carried out using continuous techniques. Uh, we identified up to 40.4% uh, methane, but very low flow rates. And through other lines of evidence associated with the history and the uh, content of, on the landfill, um, we confirmed that actually it was CS3 conditions. It can be uh, developed for housing so long as appropriate gas protection measures are installed. Um, this was then challenged. Um, the planning authority um, 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 didn't approve the development. It went to appeal and on appeal uh, over the last few days, it, it has been granted planning permission. So a little bit more detail. This was a form of brick brickworks and a clay pit uh, back in 68. Uh, 1979, uh, the site was restored in inverted commas with waste. Uh, the pit, pit backfilled up to original ground level. Um, for, in 2002, the brickworks were demolished. And in 2006, the area of the brickworks were then redeveloped for, for housing. And then, now in 2024, uh, planning approval, approval for private housing has been granted uh, for uh, the rest of the site, uh, despite the fact that it is a former landfill. And, and there's, a, uh, there's a, a link to a recent uh, BBC news report. There. Okay, um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that useful. Uh, this is part of a series of webinars that GGS will be uh, presenting over, over the rest of the year. Um, you can find out more details of, of these events uh, from our website. We also are doing in-person training, uh, an advanced A to Z of ground gas with our, our um, with PAG, PAG a Technical, um, who are uh, another company we work uh, uh, with on occasions. Uh, we've been de delivering these A to Z uh, training events now for coming on 13 years. So um, um, if you want in-depth knowledge, those uh, in-person training events are, are well worth attending. Um, <laughs> excuse me. There's also a practical A to Z, which is um, designed for constructors, uh, inspectors and surveyors and they are, uh, are on slightly different days, dates. So um, back to you, Emma, and any questions which may be there? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Simon, for that very informative and insightful webinar. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the session and took a lot from it. And as mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions for Simon, now is the time to ask. And we'll, we have... We'll start with this question, which is, uh, would the building structures themselves be considered a receptor to ground gas? Building structures can be. Um, uh, in many cases, the, the concern will be the occupants of the buildings. But if, if a building is destroyed through an explosion, then clearly that is a receptor from, from ground gases. You can also have a certain amount of uh, uh, damage caused to uh, some of the construction materials from VOCs if they're not VOC resistant. Lovely. Thank you, Simon. Okay, we'll wait to see if there are any more questions. We'll just wait another minute, see if anything comes through. 
As Simon mentioned, we have we have eight webinars this year. So if you're not signed up to them yet, please feel to head over to the GGS website where all links are available. And we hope you can join us again in the future. Okay, here's another. Um, can you elaborate on the on the other lines of evidence you used in your case study example? The um, the Glen Parver uh, case study at the end uh, was um, there were surface emission surveys carried out, there were slope stability and topography assessments carried out, um, there were um, groundwater sampling carried out for dissolved gases. Quite a range of additional lines of evidence was brought to bear to try and uh, elucidate. The, the the source conditions um, and the, the conclusion was that yes there was um, organic material present beneath the site but it was not uh, generating ground gases at, at any particular rate and is unlikely to in the future indeed um, as time goes by the gas generation rate would be reducing Excellent, thank you. Um, okay, question from Holly. How often does gas accumulation from peat present a problem, or it or is you is it usually the rate of generation cancelled by the rate of dispersion where possible? Uh, absolutely, Holly. Um, the the rate of dispersion is is um, soon as the the methane. Uh, uh, leaves the surface, it will be diluted. And because it's such a small volume of gas, it, it is diluted to negligible concentrations almost immediately. I am not aware of any uh, sites where uh, methane from peat deposits have caused the problem. Lovely, thank you. Uh, from Maureen. Have there been any situations where the land has been so contaminated that remedial measures are not cost effective? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to Holly's point. Um, methane from peat is, is not a problem so long as you've got uh, some pressure relief layer or some venting layer. It's very easy to do. And older properties are poorly vent are poorly um, sealed anyway. They will be quite drafty if they're Victorian or older. So that's why there's no no problems identified with 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 peat uh, building on peat. Sorry, um, Emma. What was the next question? Next question was: Have there been any situations where the land has been so contaminated that remedial measures are not cost effective? Yes, um, this this will be this does happen from time to time. It's usually identified during the, the phase one um, stage, uh, and, and it's usually the more recent landfills which are uh, have a high putrescible content, um, and, and clearly you've got a large. For instance, it's a, 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 a large body 15 meters plus of municipal waste and it's just not cost effective to try remediating them uh, the, the the cost of of um, um, developing those those sites may be a prohibitive okay thank you in terms of monitoring would a headspace ground gas reading be acceptable upon an initial reading in a flooded well? Would bailing the well and monitoring be best practice in this scenario? This, this is quite a, a, a subject of, of, of debate. A lot of people are talking about um, the, the flooded wells. If you've got a, a response zone which is flooded and you've got the groundwater up above the response zone within the headspace area, you've got two problems. If, if there's been a drop in atmospheric pressure, you will get methane coming out of solution, building up into that headspace. You will also have um, 
that headspace compressed by the rising groundwater table, which means that uh, it will be under pressure and you get a high flow rate. Those readings are not going to be representative of, of, of the site. The site itself will have very low gas, gas risk potentially because there's no open pathway for, for it to migrate. All you've got is the, the gas is present in the dissolved phase. Um, there may be uh, some methane. Methane is very has a low, low um, permeability, low solubility in groundwater, uh, and it doesn't like being in solution. So any change, any disruption to that groundwater, such as a drop in atmospheric pressure, will give rise to some methane coming out. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is uh, 58 times more soluble. And it will stay in solution irrespective of what, what is happening in, in, in the atmospheric conditions. So um, you can take a reading of a flooded well um, from uh, the headspace of, of a monitoring well. And it will tell you what's coming out of solution. That in itself will be a line of evidence, but it isn't going to give you an indication of what the risk is to, to a... Uh, a, a development. All it will tell you is that um, this is what's coming out of solution uh, and the, 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 the concentration and the flow rate may not be um, um, uh, indicative of what's happening on the wider side. Okay, thank you. Um, is it possible for an unregulated or, Ill or illegal above ground raised landfill to cause ground gas problems? Uh, an illegal above ground landfill, they would typically, uh, as far as, uh, in, in the, the 90s, when after the Environmental Protection Act came in, there was a lot of illegal landfills being being made um, typically they they will only be a risk for that particular location it won't necessarily be a risk off-site if it's above ground any any landfill gas which is generated within it will generally escape to atmosphere there will be no way um, it can migrate laterally unless it's contained in some way if it's capped if, if such a landfill is capped, then that, that um, free venting to atmosphere will be will be prevented, and then that landfill gas will try and get out elsewhere. But that will probably be around the edge of that cap. If there's permeable soils, then it may go sideways. It all depends on on the topography, the the um, um, the, the level of uh, capping that has been uh, included. And if it's illegal, probably no capping. Looking at topography, how effective is topography within a permeable geology in the dilution or dispersal of ground gases and VOCs away from receptors? The ground gases including VOCs, will always try and find the, the easiest route to, to um, uh, escape, either escape down a concentration gradient or by advection through pressure-driven flow. So uh, the topography can have a uh, profound effect in permeable soils. Uh, methane, for instance, is light of an air. It will tend to rise up through permeable strata. Uh, carbon dioxide will tend to do the opposite. Uh, so you can get stratification in permeable strata uh, where uh, carbon dioxide will flow down to the lowest point on a site. Um, on, there's there's uh, an anecdote that uh, one of our delegates at a training event gave us where there was a but an undulating landfill, and he was a regulator who was doing um, uh, monitoring of uh, across his site. There was a, a clear winter's day, blue sky, high pressure system, 
present. But in a depression on the surface of a landfill, he found dead rabbits. Those dead rabbits had been asphyxiated by carbon dioxide pooling at the bottom of, of the hill uh, in, in, that low, in that lower depression. And more uh, striking was the fact that next to those dead rabbits, there was a dead kestrel. Uh, the kestrel had flown down and just in the time it was, it, it landed on the ground. It was overcome by the carbon dioxide and also died. So yes, topography can have a, a, a profound effect uh, and carbon dioxide will tend to go to the lowest point. Methane will tend to migrate to the highest points on the site. Okay. Now we only have time for one more question, but you can always email Simon if you if your question hasn't been answered today. Do feel free to send over your questions. Um, presumably, all gas monitoring should include monitoring of the shallow surface or the depth to which the foundations will extend. If a gas source is present at depth, if it can't migrate to the surface, as evidenced by shallow monitoring, then there is not an unacceptable risk. Um, yes, good question. I mean, the, 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 I made an example, I, I made reference to an example where, uh, as part of a land development scheme, there had been uh, uh, mines gas present at shallow depth on the site. That site was then reprofiled with clean, clean clay, which was brought on site. Uh, and laid and compacted in layers. And there was a, between, uh, I think, eight and 10 meters of, of clay built up on, 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 on top of this permeable strata, sandstone strata with mines gas. And we put in shallow mine, uh, shallow boreholes and did continuous monitoring in those shallow boreholes to demonstrate that, uh, that, that no, no mines gas was migrating through to the surface. And, and the final design for, for those residential properties on that side were going to have um, shallow strip footings. So we were able to demonstrate with that, sh that uh, shallow monitoring that the risk had been uh, effective of a pathway and be affected, effectively removed. Wonderful. Thank you, Simon. And thank you to everybody else for joining us today. Um, make sure you head to the website, find out when our next session is, and we hope that you can tune in at another time. Send over any questions, or if you think you, that we can help you with any projects that you're dealing with at the moment, do feel get, to get in touch for some advice from our experts. And have a wonderful day. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye for now.